John chapter 14. Let's begin reading in verse 8. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Philip does not need to know God the Father. What Philip needs is to know that he knows the Father, because he does. He knows Jesus, and that is the same as knowing the Father. Jesus is Almighty God in human flesh. Him and He and God the Father are the same. That's why Jesus could say, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you know me, you know the Father. What a remarkable statement for a human being to make. People who say that Jesus did not claim to be God, he was just a good man, they better think again. Jesus is either a lunatic, a blasphemer, or he is Almighty God, as he said. And he is Almighty God. Verse 10. Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Now, Jesus' words never contradicted his actions. He was always perfectly consistent what he said and what he did. And that is because both of his, both his words and his actions were under the complete control of Almighty God all the time. Verse 11. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. In other words, Jesus is saying, believe my words when I tell you that I and the Father are one. But if you can't believe my words, then believe my actions, because they testify to the fact that that is true. If my words are not enough, then believe my actions, believe my miracles, is what Jesus is saying. You know, if there really is an all-powerful, all-holy, all-loving, all-merciful, all-wise God, then you would expect Him to act and to speak like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why He said, Take a look at my words, take a look at my actions, and believe. Pretty obvious. Anybody with an open mind that He is God. Verse 12, I tell you the truth, Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. You realize what Jesus is saying here? He is saying that Christians will do greater things than he did. Greater things than him. Someone says, Christians are going to do greater things than Jesus? How can that be? Well, that's what he said. See, I, I just can't. I mean, he raised people from the dead. He healed the sick. He cured lepers. He did all these wonderful things. Yeah, and the Apostle Peter preached one sermon on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 souls were saved from hell. When Jesus said Christians will be doing greater works than even he did, it's not talking about greater physical miracles. It's talking about greater miracles, period. And I can tell you this. 3,000 souls saved with one sermon. 3,000 souls saved from hell. That is greater than any miracle that Jesus did while he was here. It is greater to save a soul than it is to cure a paralytic. It is greater to save a soul than it is to give sight to the blind. It is greater to save a soul than even to raise somebody from the dead. Those are all wonderful things. But none of those things come close to to being as powerful, as great as saving a soul from hell. And so with the Word of God and the Spirit of God, we can do greater things. We can see greater miracles today as Christians than even what Jesus did when he was here. 13. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to to the Father. You may ask for anything in my name, 
and I will do it. Jesus says, if you pray for anything in my name, I'm going to do it for you. And you say, well, man, that means I've got to tack on in Jesus' name, amen, to the end of all my prayers because then I know for sure I'm going to get what I asked for. No, that's not what it means. But that's okay to do that. I do that. However, to pray in Jesus' name means to pray consistent with the Word of God and consistent with the character of Jesus Christ. And so what Jesus is saying is this, when we pray for something that is in line with the Word of God and consistent with the character of Christ, we know we're going to get what we ask for. And God will be more than happy to give us what we ask for. When the time is right, He'll do it. We've got His Word on it. Verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And that's reasonable, isn't it? If you love Jesus, you're going to do what He says. You're going to want to please Him. Now, you don't tell someone that you love them and then continue to do things that irritate them. And do it on purpose with no intentions of stopping. That's not love. That's mockery. And it's the same in our relationship with God. Don't tell God that you love Him, but continue to sin. Continue to do things that you know are offensive to Him and not even care about changing. That's not love. That's mockery also. No wonder Jesus said, If you love me, obey my commands. You will obey my commands. So some people have a hard time understanding loving God. It really doesn't have anything to do with feelings. It has everything in the world to do with obeying Him. If you obey Him, you love Him. Verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. And that other counselor that will be with us forever is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit stays in a Christian forever. Once He comes in, the second you're saved, He never leaves, ever. Jesus did not kick his men out of their group when they sinned. He didn't say, well, you committed this sin, Peter. (laughs) That's it. You're out of this group. You're not going to be one of my apostles. He didn't do that. He was grieved when they sinned, but he put up with it. Now, here's the thing. The presence of the Holy Spirit in us Christians today has replaced the presence of Jesus in the world physical presence of Jesus in the world. And like Christ, the Holy Spirit is grieved when a Christian sins, but he doesn't leave a Christian when they sin. He puts up with it. He hangs in there. Verse 17. The Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. You know, one of the unique things about this church age is that the Holy Spirit actually lives inside of God's people forever. See, it wasn't that way in the past at all. In the past, the Holy Spirit had always been with God's people, always been with them, and even came upon them and empowered them for service temporarily. But these these days, since the day of Pentecost, Pentecost, I'm sorry, He is in us, and He is in us for good. He remains in us forever. Verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, Jesus has been talking about leaving the apostles and how they cannot go where He is going, at least right now. And so Jesus, though not present with His people physically, since He ascended into heaven has not left us alone. He really has remained with us. We have God's literal spirit inside of us. Now you think about this. It's not a force. It's not a feeling. When you receive Jesus Christ into your life as Lord and Savior, when you get saved, the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ literally comes to live inside of you. That means His mind, His emotions, His will... His spirit, his soul, is inside of you if you are a Christian. Now, that's an even better setup than the apostles had. Well, it was wonderful. You know, they could look across the room and see Jesus if he was there with them. That was fantastic. But, you know, he wasn't always there with them. And now he's not in the world at all physically, but he is inside every Christian forever. That's pretty fantastic when you think about it. Verse 19. 
Before long, the world will not see me anymore. Stop there. The world will not see me anymore, Jesus said. Why just the world? Because after Jesus was raised from the dead, he didn't appear to lost sinners. After he was raised, he only appeared to his people. He appeared to several hundred of his followers at one time, but it was only to his followers that he appeared to, and they were to be his witnesses to testify to the fact that he was raised to a lost world. But notice, before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. Fantastic. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is God's plan to you as a Christian that he will raise you from the dead as well. That is what Jesus meant when he said, because I live, you will live also. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I have said this in the past, is a prototype of our resurrection. It is just the first fruits. It's just a little sample of our resurrection as Christians. Verse 20. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Jesus says, on that day you are going to realize that I am in you. That day refers to the day when Jesus says Holy Spirit to live in his people. That day began on the day of Pentecost, when his followers were filled with his Spirit. And that day has continued right on down to today. Like I said before, when you repent and you say, Jesus, save my soul, take control of my life, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ comes to live inside of you. Jesus says, in that day, you will know that I am inside of you. You know, there is a real change that takes place in a person's thinking when they get saved, when they receive Christ. There's a real change. They do not laugh at crude jokes anymore if they were used to doing that. They, they don't do it anymore. They don't like it when people take Christ's name in vain anymore. They don't think that getting drunk is fun anymore. Things change. They don't like sin in general anymore. What happened? Why the change? Jesus has moved inside of them. That's what happened. And so you know that Jesus is in you you know that you are saved and you know that Jesus is in you when your attitude towards sin changes. Verse 21. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. There it is again. If you love God, it's going to be seen in the fact that you obey his commands. Christian love, by the way, does not exist outside the realm of truth and outside the realm of obedience to God. You are not acting in a loving way towards someone if you are telling them something that is contrary to Scripture. You are not acting in a loving way towards someone if you are disobeying God. But what great rewards there are for people who love God and show that love by their obedience. The Father, Jesus said the Father will show his love to a person like that. Jesus reveals himself to a person like that. In other words, great times of wonderful fellowship with Almighty God are there for the obedient Christian to enjoy. And nothing beats that. Verse 22. Then Judas, not Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Not to the world. In other words, this apostle he says, why are you only going to reveal yourself to us and not to the lost world? He seems to be concerned about the world being left out. But really, there was no need for any concern because the Bible says, whosoever will may come and receive Christ. The invitation is open to anyone. And what Christ says in verse 23 goes along with that. Jesus, Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Well, if Philip were Judas, not Iscariot, if he was concerned about the world being left out, he should not be. 
Because if somebody loves the Lord and shows it by their obedience, they won't be left out. They'll be more than happy, and so will the Father, to come and have fellowship with them. But here's the thing. Obedience to God springs out of a love for God. Jesus and the Father will not come and have close friendship with the disobedience. Why would they? Why would they go where they're not wanted? Why would they why would they go where they are constantly being offended and where they are not cared about? You wouldn't do that, would you? You wouldn't hang out someone who didn't watch you around and showed it by their contempt for you. You wouldn't want that either. And neither does the Father, and neither does the Son. Twenty five. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Stop there for a second. Now, Jesus is talking specifically to his apostles here in verses 25 and 26. He is not talking to us. He is not talking to anyone else. And what he is saying to his apostles is that the Holy Spirit will work in their minds to remind them of the things that Jesus has spoken, the things that he has already talked about. The Holy Spirit will work in their minds, not in ours. And so, what we have here is a promise of revelation to the, to the apostles and a, and a promise of inspiration. And the good news for us is that we have every single word that the Holy Spirit reminded them of concerning Jesus. We have every single word that the Holy Spirit inspired them to write down. We have it right here in the Holy Bible, the New Testament, written by the apostles or friends of the apostles. Verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. The world cannot possibly give you peace. I may be talking to somebody right now. You've got a lot of the world's goods. You've got it pretty much made, but there is something that eats at the inside of you, and it is the fear of death. You're not sure what's going to happen, and you're not sure you're ready. You hope you are, but you're not sure. And you remember being taught about hell as a little boy or a little girl, and it kind of bugs you. You're trying to suppress it, but it still kind of makes its way to the surface of your mind. Listen, the world cannot possibly give you peace. It can't. The world can provide distractions so that you can forget about reality for a while. I mean, you can watch a Packer game for three hours on Sunday afternoon and forget about the fact that you have school the next day or forget about the fact that you have to get up early and go to work. It can provide a distraction. Or you can go to Disney World or wherever you want to go and have some fun and and do certain things and, and make you forget about the cares of this world for a few hours or a couple of days or something like that. But the world's amusements cannot give you peace because the world's amusements cannot take away the fear of death. And until the fear of death is gone, there can be no peace. Peace of mind that can only come from knowing that your sins are forgiven and gone forever and you don't have to fear death, that only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ because he paid for those sins and you must receive him to find forgiveness. 28. You heard me say, I am glad I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. But if you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. You know, the disciples' love at this point was kind of selfish. It really was. They wanted to keep Jesus around because they liked it that way. They were not thinking about Jesus. Evidently, they had not considered the humiliation involved in Almighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ, becoming a man and living on this earth. They had not considered that. They're thinking about themselves. And so, if the love of the apostles is pure, sure, they're going to miss Christ. They'll miss him, but at the same time, they're going to be happy for him that he is returning to the Father. He is going to a better place. Verse 29. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Now, Jesus predicted that he would die. He predicted 
that he would be raised. He also predicted that he would be ascending into heaven. So then after all this is done, and it really happens, the disciples will believe that he is God. 30. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. The prince of this world refers to Satan. And Jesus says the devil has no hold on him, no claim on him at all. And that is because Christ never sinned. You see, Satan, he can accuse us to God anytime he wants to. I mean, he can say about us, God, they are sinners, and they deserve hell. And you know what? It's probably the only truthful thing the devil ever says, because it is true. We are sinners, and we do deserve hell. And we will go to hell unless we receive Christ and find forgiveness in him. So he can accuse us anytime he wants to, but he has no claim on Christ. No accusations would stick, because Jesus never sinned, not even once. That doesn't mean he's not going to die, though. It doesn't mean he's not going to suffer. Verse 31, look at it. But the world must learn that I love the Father, and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now. Let us leave. Jesus isn't going to die because Satan accused him of sin and he was right. He's going to die for our sin and because he loves the Father. And so the cross proves that Jesus loves us. That's for sure. But the cross, which was the Father's will for Jesus, also proves that he loves the Father. And he's willing to obey the Father even to the point of dying on the cross. And once again we see that Christ's command to us to love the Father, to love God, is modeled by Him to the greatest degree possible. Let's go into chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Now, the vine is an Old Testament symbol of the nation Israel. They are God's vine. That is what they are called in the Old Testament. But now Jesus, notice what He says. He says, I am the true vine, I'm the true vine, is what Christ says. In other words, the Israelites were no longer to seek to be identified with the nation Israel. From this point on, they're, they're to seek to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just the Israelites, but all people were not to be seeking to be identified with the nation Israel, which used to be the conduit of salvation, but now we're to seek to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the true vine. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, becoming an Israelite is no longer the way to, to salvation. Instead, to be saved, you need to be a Christian. Verse 1 again, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Notice verse 2. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. To be in Him, to be in Christ, is to be saved. That's what it means. It's just just a, a, a way of saying you're saved. I'm in Christ, I'm saved, I'm in Christ, I'm a Christian. Jesus said, every person in me, in other words, every Christian who doesn't bear fruit, God cuts off. You say, man, that, that sounds kind of scary. God cuts off every Christian who doesn't bear fruit. In other words... He takes them away from the place where they are able to bear fruit. doesn't mean you lose your salvation if you're really saved. You can't. But he does remove you from the place where you can be productive. This is the thing that the Apostle Paul was scared of. He was afraid of this. He wasn't afraid of losing his salvation. But he did say, I beat my body into subjection, lest after I preach to others, I myself become a castaway. That's the thing that he was afraid of being set on the shelf, as it were, and not being able to be used by God because of moral default. See, if a Christian doesn't live for the Lord, if a Christian continues to live in sin, they tarnish God's reputation. That's why he sets them aside as an instrument. He doesn't use them. They become an embarrassment to him. Notice verse 2 again. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will bear even more fruitful. It is good to be a Christian who is living for God and bearing fruit for his glory, bearing spiritual fruit, holiness, helping other people come to Christ for salvation. It's wonderful to be that way. 
But God wants even fruit-bearing Christians to bear even more spiritual fruit. So you know what he does? He prunes us. Just like somebody who has got an apple tree or grows tomato plants prunes that thing. Makes it more fruitful. And that's what God does to us. You say, well, what are his clippers? Hard times. One of the clippers he uses to prune us is hard times. Suffering. Suffering. Not fun. It hurts. But it drives us closer to Christ if we're really saved. And it makes us holier. And it makes us better Christians. It makes us more fruitful, spiritually speaking. Also, verse 3. Jesus says, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Some clipping comes from suffering. However, much of it, much of the pruning that God does, comes from the word of God as well. See, reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, listening to the Word of God being taught, even as you are doing right now, that has a way of sanctifying Christians from the inside out. A Christian cannot possibly grow in holiness unless they are in the Word of God, studying it, reading it, listening to it, being taught. It sanctifies us. It clips away at the bad in our life. Verse 4. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You know, if you cut a branch, let's say you have an apple tree. You say, I want some apples this summer, so it's spring. And you go and you cut that branch off. You cut, cut a big branch off your apple tree and you put it down in the basement so you don't have to go outside to get it. Well, you just did a very foolish thing. Because the moment you cut that branch off, it's not going to bear any fruit. It's settled. It won't. Because it needs the life-giving sap to flow from the tree into the branch to bear fruit. Same with us and Jesus and spiritual fruit. We must abide in Christ. In other words, we must stay connected to Christ. That is talking about having fellowship with Christ. We must stay connected to Christ. We must stay in fellowship with Christ through praise and prayer and the Word of God and through confessing our sins the moment that we commit those sins. We have to have fellowship with Christ. In other words, spiritual fruit comes as a byproduct of spending time with Jesus, of communicating with Him, of walking with Him. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, You can do nothing. If we choose as Christians not to pray, not to praise, not to be in the Word of God, not to confess our sins the moment we can commit them, if we choose not to do those things that keep us close to Christ, you know what's going to happen? Worldliness is going to move in. It's going to move in, and it's going to make us useless to God. Worldliness will move in, and the world will affect our thinking, and it will affect our speaking, and it will affect our talking and our actions. And, you know, if our fellowship with Christ is cut off, then He isn't going to work through us like He otherwise could because the branch has been severed from the tree. Verse 6. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If a person doesn't live for the Lord, they call themselves a Christian, and they don't live for the Lord. They may be saved. They just may be backslidden. That's possible. Read the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. It's possible they're saved, but they're backslidden. Boy, if they are, they're in trouble, though. Because the Bible says that who the Father loves, He chastens. And He disciplines every one of His children. So they're in for a good whipping from their Heavenly Father if they genuinely are saved but they're not living for Him so there's that possibility but then there are others who call themselves Christians and they are not living for the Lord and the reason is they're not saved at all they're just Christians in name only they're going to be gathered they're going to be burned see there's going to be a lot of church going people burning in hell forever because that is all they were church going people they never repented They never ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. They're just church going. They're just members of some church. That's not good enough. Verse 7. 
If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is fantastic. If you pray, if you praise God, if you pray, if you read the Word, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, walk in obedience to God. If when you commit a sin, you confess that sin, you get back on track right away. If you're walking with the Lord the way you should be, you can pray for anything that you want. And you know what? Jesus says God's going to give it to you. That's because the anything you ask for is not going to be something that your sin nature craves. See, if you are filled with God, if God is the most important thing to you, that's going to be reflected in the things you pray for, the things that you ask for. Your prayers are going to be generated by the Holy Spirit like the rest of your life, and you're going to ask for things that God wants to give you, and He's going to give them to you. You know, my son, I I never... If he would ever say, Dad, I'd like to skip... If he'd ever say, Dad, I'd like to skip... Uh, dessert tonight and I would just like to eat half a dozen carrots you know I wouldn't have any trouble at all he has asked for something according to my will by all means go ahead Aaron eat all the carrots you want see the problem is too many Christians ask for cake from God or cookies from God instead of carrots but if we would ask for the right things he'd be more than happy to give them to us verse 8 speaking of prayer this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourself to be my disciples. The purpose for prayer is not to get what we want. That may be the first time you ever heard that. But this is the truth. The, fir- the purpose for prayer is not to get what you want, or not for me to get what I want. It is to find out what God wants and ask for it so that he will be glorified. That's the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer is for us to ask for things that honor God. Now, it's perfectly fine to ask for things that we want. If we believe that is consistent with the character of Almighty God and consistent with the Word of God. It's not always. You know, sometimes we were mistaken, but that's the way to pray. Something else here. Verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. What does it mean to remain in His love? Remaining in the love of Jesus Christ is the same as abiding. In, the, in Christ. Remaining in the love of Christ is the same as abiding in Christ. It means stay connected to Him through fellowship. God wants us to be in a position where He can show His love to us. That's why He wants us to remain in Christ. Remain in fellowship with Him. That is the same as a remaining in His love. He wants us to be in a position where He can show His love to us. But He cannot do that if we cut ourselves off through disobedience. I'm going to stop with verse 10. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love. And so, when we keep God's commands, we remain in His love. And we put ourselves in a position to be blessed by Him. There are so many wonderful byproducts to, to our obedience to Christ. So many wonderful things. And I hope you are taking advantage of those things by obeying Christ. And when you fail, confess, get right back on track. That's the only way to live as a Christian. Until next week, Mike Moret, Scripture Verse by Verse, reminding you to stay in the Word and stay in prayer. And let me close with a prayer for you right now. Lord God in heaven, I pray that you would teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Let the beauty of the Lord our God rest upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. In Jesus' name.